We thank you, Lord, for your word to us. It's a light for our path. It is food for our soul. May it be so for us this morning. Amen. Um, I was in a conversation with a group of leaders this week, and someone raised a question, what's the vision statement for your organisation? Which is a great question, but I noticed my reaction to it. Straight away, my eyes rolled with a certain degree of cynicism. I think I put vision statement up there with the management tools of the 1990s. And I might be showing my age, but you might remember that time when there were tomes of wisdom plied out to the up-and-coming leaders of the age. And we had books like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and Ten Natural Laws of Successful Time and Life Management and the five most important questions you will ever ask about your organisation and the One Minute Manager and even Jesus, CEO, using ancient wisdom for visionary leadership. And... <laughs> I know I'm really a little cynical, but, uh, but I wonder if you've had a similar experience. I, I may have, it may not be in the world of, of leadership or management, but there's always a magazine or a book or a podcast or something in the self-help section. Here's how to be a better you. Do these things and you'll be awesome, or at the very least, you'll be acceptably good. And yes, I am having a laugh and being a bit cynical, but the thing is, there was, and at least, some degree of wisdom in books and resources like this. But for myself, I found that for every bit of wisdom and truth I gleaned from things like this, I would run into something. And, and that something was me. I would run into myself. For every inspiring word I would read, there was in myself a response of inadequacy or weariness or even shame and regret. For every little dream or excitement it stoked, there was a hollowness where it rested almost entirely on me. And of course, when it comes to the shaping of our lives as we who are Christians, as we seek to follow Jesus, well, it's not meant to be like that, is it? But if I'm honest... Over the last 30 to 40 years of my experience with the Christian industrial complex, um, we're sort of brought into this religion of self-help, except we take these sorts of books and other resources and we paint them with churchy colours. And some of it is blatant copycat stuff and utterly shallow. Your best life now, seven steps to living at your full potential, or I declare... 31 promises to speak over your life. Well, they're real book titles. Uh, but of course, that's Joel Osteen, and it's reasonably easy to set aside his worldly wisdom along with his perfect teeth and say, yeah, okay, that's not got much to do with what it means to follow Jesus. But, but how about these sorts of resources? Eight life shapes, or love wins, or the lost message of Jesus and Paul. I mean, some of these books I actually agree with. I mean, there's some truth in at least some of these sorts of resources. So why can't I just help myself to that truth? I mean, isn't in the end, isn't that what Christian discipleship's meant to be about? Learn the right things, apply the six, seven or ten habits of the effective Christian life and then work out what's next and do it all again? Isn't it? Isn't, isn't, it, isn't, that's why, isn't that why we have Lent courses and conferences and podcasts and sermons? I mean, if it's not working for you, I can go and polish my teeth a bit more if that would help. <laughs> but maybe, and it may just be me here, the sort of way, this sort of, that sort of way of self-managed growth leaves me very, feeling very similar to any of those other self-help books of the 1990s weary and very much aware of my own inadequacy. Something inside of me says, that's not the way of Christ. In fact, in the early 2000s, two sociologists suggest that underneath the culture of our mainstream Christian discipleship, if you can call it that, wasn't actually a theology of the gospel, but a different philosophy. And they called it moral therapeutic deism, which are Three long words, but in sessions it means this. It's deism, because even though God is mentioned and believed in, he isn't really in the room 
God's an object of study, not subjectively present or accounted for. It's therapeutic because all the way in which we manifest ourselves makes it all about me and about my full potential or the size of my business or the success of my family or the, the number of people in my church. And it's moralistic because it's usually espoused by a set of rules and principles which the proper sort of people should easily be able to do. And I've come to realise that that is an unhappy form of discipleship. If that is our default, cu- default culture, both in the church and out of it, then the weariness and the inadequacy abounds. We might have all these Christian things in front of us, worship experiences, Sunday meetings, Bible study opportunities, social activism, and we can see that there is goodness in them because there is. Just like there is truth in some of these books. And we are drawn to that goodness. And yet it also feeds a deep and inner frustration because in the hands of a moralistic, therapeutic, deistic way of life, It leads to a frustrated powerlessness. I never seem to get there. How can I do better? And around the circle we go. Now, I'm painting a reasonably bleak picture, but I want to be clear here. I'm not having a whinge at our church culture and our way of life. Because there is nothing new under the sun. And we're not the first generation to explore this frustration. Even ancient philosophers would complain about, about how they could figure out what was right and wrong, but even if they could figure it out and write books about it, it didn't actually lead to them doing that right thing. They knew what it, like, what it was like to collide with themselves. And it's also this sort of thing that Paul is bringing us to as we come alongside our reading for today in chapter 7, because Paul is expressing the same frustration. And he's doing that, as we get to our reading, by taking on the persona of a scholarly religious Jewish man, which of course he was. And throughout the chapter, he refers to himself a lot in the first person. I find, I see, I, I, I. But he's doing this rhetorically. He's putting himself into the experience of a larger general group. If Paul was a posh Englishman, he might be saying it like this. One does not understand what one does, does one. And I'm glad he doesn't say it like that, but I hope you get the point. He's including more than just himself in what he says. And particularly, he's including his Jewish family who have arrived at his time holding on to God's law with a moralistic intent. And that is where we come. As Paul unpacks his experience of frustrated, pain-filled pseudo-discipleship, He isn't taking us to some ultimately flawed, ultimately empty rendition of life like many of these books have. He's actually finding that frustration as he appeals to something more true, more good, more perfect and even more divine. He's finding this frustration is true even when he appeals to God's law itself. You see, in his day, the Old Testament Torah and the prophets and the history and the law and the Psalms, these were not facile. These were not a single, there was not a single stroke of the pen that was duplicitous. There was not a single verse that was false. It was and is the inspired instruction by which God's people might truly live as God's people in holiness and justice and even joy. And Paul and all his Jewish brothers and sisters knew it chapter and verse. Within those pages and in those scrolls, there was truth and life and and held out the fruits and the blessings of obedience. And those who knew it, like Paul did, would yearn for it and be drawn to that goodness. But as Paul is about to point out, the law alone was not enough to stop that encounter being a collision with himself. I've talked about the weariness and inadequacy of approaching truth in our own strength. Paul much more profoundly calls that collision the sin in me. And he describes it like this. He says, we know that the law is spiritual. It is a good book, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. 
I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. It is. But as it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. I collide with myself, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And it looks like frustrated longing. It looks like the constant awareness of inadequacy and of falling short. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law I work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Can you hear the frustration? The truth on one hand and his own inadequacy on the other. And this is deeper than mere cynicism. This borders on anguish. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I see its beauty and its truth. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What is it, this thing inside us, whereby even if we know the truth, even if we know what is right, even if we have the words of God himself, we find ourselves incapable of pursuing it in our own strength. Living in the constancy of that is bordering on the traumatic. Understandably, of course, we try and resolve that tension. One way we do that is if we try and amend the truth. If the light that we see is revealing the tension that we experience, then we try and dim that light. We try and put aside our legalism by trying to shallow down the law just a little. We hear what God says and we say, no, that bit's too hard. I can do that bit, but I can't do that over there. God really didn't say that, did he? Or didn't mean it in the way that I thought he meant it. And we do this calculus. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with studying God's law to clarify it and understand it's better. But that's different to trying to explain it away. To reconfigure our legalism so that the seven effective habits of the law espouses the seven things that we're good at. But remember, Paul here is speaking on behalf of his Jewish family. And he's fully aware of how the history of his family is filled with the cheapening of God's truth. From the wandering of them, wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness in the days of Moses through to the exile in Babylon, through out of all, the way of Paul's people was constantly to undermine and to reconfigure God's word. Just like Adam and Eve, Paul's family were constantly asking Did God really say? And choosing their own way and the consequences of it. The thing is, we might be able to throw away Joel Osteen, Rob Bell and perish the thought, even Steve Covey. But we can't throw away the word of God. We We can't throw away what is true. Even if we can't live up to it. Even if that truth leads us into a tension of our own inadequacy. Well, let us be false and God be true. Remember how Jesus watched many of his followers walk away when the teaching got hard? He looked at his disciples and he asked if they were going to. And they said, but you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Paul is clear clear throughout his revelation of this anguish, throughout his understanding of this tension, we can't resolve it by diminishing the goodness of God's law. Well, if we can't do that, then perhaps the other tactic is to rather than push God's word down, we might big ourselves up 
And that was also common in Paul's world and us. We magnify our virtue, we draw people to our cause, we justify ourselves, or maybe we just diligently get on with our duty in order to put ourselves beyond reproach. Many of us in the Christian life do that by using the forms of Christian spirituality. We use the forms of Christianity to cover that tension that is there beneath. Paul, later in his ministry, teaches his student Timothy, and he talks about this and he says that this is the form of godliness, but denying its power. We can fake it for a while. We can even get perfect teeth. But the tension is still there. In the end, it's the same dilemma. We can have the fullness of God's truth, but then we run into ourselves. Who will rescue us from this body that is subject to death? I love how Tom Wright translates Paul's answer. What a miserable person I am, he says, experiencing this tension. Who is going to rescue me from the body of this death? Well, thank God. Through Jesus, our King and our Lord. So then, left to my own self, I am slave to God's law with my mind and to sin's law with my human flesh. Can you see the resolution there? The problem exists when I'm left to my own self. The law, the truth, enslaves me in mind and flesh. But who can rescue me? Jesus, our King and our Lord. The problem, you see, is not God's good law. It's our moralistic, therapeutic, deistic, self-centred, self-loving approach to it. And remember, what underlies the heart of Paul's gospel is not to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps to meet God's law. His is a gospel of covenant union, of God's desire for restoration of relationship with his people and our inclusion in their number. His desire is to be with us and for us to simply trust him. It's that trust, that faith that justifies and fulfills the law. And it's into that trust and faith that we can rest all our expectations and our inadequacies. The law is not wrong and we are not yet fully right on its terms, but he is with us. And in the next chapter, which we're going to look at next week, we're going to see the expounded and all the fullness of the joy of it. But for now, let's sit in this truth. God is not wrong. But what counts us right is not our adequacy or our success or our ability or even our moral purity. What counts us as right is our belonging to him. So in this moment... And especially in the moment of this season, where we are all at our weakest and our weariest, and the thought of coming up with a vision statement and doing all manner of other self-help tasks which fills us with inadequacy. Let us put aside our striving. Let us step back from our existential angst, which leaks out of us in frustration and fear, and in which we load up ourselves or each other with burdens and expectation of performance. Let's just breathe for a moment because we belong to him. Let us not be that people on the way. Let's not be that people of striving as we come out of COVID. Let us not be self-made in whatever we build in our families or our careers or in what's left of life after this season has ended. Let's put our trust in Jesus who is present with us right now, who will save us in what comes next. Thanks be to God, it is through Jesus Christ our Lord that we belong and we are saved. Amen and amen.